Good morning and good afternoon again to everybody. Thank you for being on today's webinar. We've got a big group of people on right now and we have a lot to cover, so we're going to get started. Today's webinar is going to cover the Inflation Reduction Act and how energy storage and solar tax credits are going to affect your future, future project economics for your solar and energy storage projects. Of course, the Inflation Reduction Act was signed into law last month, providing a historic $369 billion of clean energy and climate investments over the next 10 years. And since, since it being signed, our team has been diving deep into these energy storage and solar tax provisions within the bill to really understand how these tax credits will affect the economics of different types of projects and which markets will see increased growth as a result of this bill. We know there have been a lot of summary webinars on the IRA, but the goal of this webinar is to provide you with actionable short and long-term steps to fully capitalize on the legislation. We've got a great team of experts on today's webinar with us. Jeremiah Miller, Director of Storage Markets and Policy at SIA joins us from the Energy Tool Base team. We have Adam Gerza, VP of Business Development, and Chris Seffel, our Enterprise Sales Manager. A few housekeeping items before we dive in. This webinar is being recorded and we will be sending this out after the webinar along with the entire slide deck that you're about to see. So please be on the lookout for that email this afternoon. And we do understand there's going to be a lot of questions as we go through today's webinar. We will be doing our Q&A at the end of the webinar, but feel free to use that chat box feature to send your questions in throughout the webinar. And we likely won't get to them all, but we, um, we want to keep this to an hour. But we'll be doing some follow-ups after the webinar if we didn't address your question. And a quick look at today's agenda before I pass it off. We're going to start with an overview of the IRA and those solar and um, storage tax credit provisions, and then we're going to move into the effects you'll be seeing. You'll be seeing, particularly with standalone energy storage economics, with that 30% ITC. We'll also be diving into how do the economics of PV and ESS change, and then the one main thing, like I mentioned before, that we want to focus on is how developers can capitalize on the IRA. We are going to be covering a lot, so I want to pass it over to the speakers, and I am going to hand things over to Jeremiah. All right, thank you, Tracy, and you can see my screen, right? Looks good. All right, hi all, I'm Jeremiah Miller from the Solar Energy Industry Association, and you know, working with the Energy Tool Base team, they've done some really sharp analysis around uh, how the impacts of this bill could start to influence energy markets, especially around storage. So I'm really excited to join today, and I'll, I'll really just give you a highlight of, uh, of some of those storage uh, aspects in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So. To get started, you know, for SIA, where we are the leading uh, uh, trade group for transforming the clean energy economy, creating the framework for solar to achieve 30% of U.S. electricity generation by 2030. And SIA works with its 1,000 plus member companies and other strategic partners to fight for policies that create jobs in every community and shape fair market rules that promote competition and growth of a reliable and low cost uh, solar power and storage uh, resources. Founded in 1974, SIA is the nation's uh, leading trade organization for solar and storage. And we're working to build a comprehensive vision for this next decade for how we deploy and grow those resources. So today, I'm just gonna highlight a few of those uh, IRA uh, aspects as they apply to storage. You know, the, the IRA itself represents the single biggest climate investment in US history. The bill can, contains transformational policies that will create hundreds of thousands of new jobs energize our economy and decarbonize the electric grid. <clears throat> the opportunities in the near term are enormous. We'll see companies expand into new markets. We'll see new manufacturing facilities pop up across the country. U.S. manufacturers will hire thousands of workers and will make a serious dent in carbon emissions. The 33 billion solar industry today will balloon to, you know, about 150 billion over that time. And, it'll, and solar will make a substantial portion of our uh, electricity mix. Solar remains incredibly popular across the country and more families and businesses will increasingly turn to solar and storage to power their lives. You know, in the IRA, the, the words, the language in that bill really matter. Their interpretation, federal guidance, and implementation all matter. So keep the engagement here and we'll see you up. You know, working together to ensure that 
the IRA catalyzes our industry is essential to meeting our jobs, equity, environment, and energy goals. My presentation today is just highlights of a deeper dive of the IRA that's explained uh, in a CIA webinar held just um, last week. Um, the archives and access to the slides, as well as detailed summary information, are available to CM members on our website, which I'll, I'll provide the details at the end. Okay, so let's dive in, and, uh, and here are the basics. So first up is Section 48 of the Investment Tax Credit, um, or the ITC, and the new Solar Production Credit, the PTC. Um, you know, these are the credits for the larger systems, you know, especially those uh, for businesses, for commercial industrial sector, for the utility scale system. Uh, and the provisions in these have, have already started. So, for example, uh, beginning construction before Treasury issues guidance on labor and prevailing wage and uh, enable uh, folks acting and getting the full 30% uh, ITC, 100% uh, PTC. Um, but important here, and these timelines are, are important relative to when those projects are placed in service, um, projects that have begun construction, uh, you know, like I said, they'll automatically go to that 30% or 100%. But after that guidance happens, there'll be a base rate of 6%, and then the ability to go up to those same levels depends on meeting apprenticeship and prevailing wage guidance from Treasury. So more details on that are available in CIA's um, uh, explainer webinar. Um, there are also adder credits. Uh, these three, uh, you know, those, for example, are uh, if placed within energy communities, meeting domestic content, and if located in a low-income or Indian tribal community. You know, the last one here also has to be allocated, meaning you have to apply to receive it. You know, these um, are, are important relative to those uh, future year credits. Um, so for CIA, for example, is de developing a detailed map of what the energy communities are, you know, where they're located and whatnot. And, um, and that's available to our members. You know, for domestic content, there, <laughs> there's actually a ton of a, a further guidance that's needed from Treasury on this. And, um, and so uh, we'll, we'll chat a little bit about that uh, later on. I have a slide. Um, but uh, on the other end of the scale, there's residential systems. So section uh, 25D has been revised. And for the investment tax credit, that's been returned to 30% as well as extending it for the next decade before it steps down. You know, for storage, the long awaited standalone revisions are included. Standalone storage has been added under, as a quali qualifying both under section 48 that I spoke about a moment ago, as well as under section 25D here. There are minimum sizes, um, which I assume will be fairly easy to meet. And, um, and so as noted here, also placed in, in service dates are important to consider. You know, for example, for systems on distribution, uh, you know, the, those those can uh, be applied now, and um, and for standalone at residential, if, if people choose to do that, they could start acting on that now. But for Section 48, uh, standalone storage isn't applicable until um, till the end of the calendar year, until January 1. Uh, so so keep in mind that we can take questions relative to clarifying that uh, later on. Uh, for distribution and for especially these smaller systems, anything smaller than five megawatts, another thing to note is that there are uh, a, there's a provision to allow interconnection costs to also be included uh, within section uh, 48. And so that's also going to be helpful. Interconnection challenges are cropping up all over the country and, and the barriers and cost prohibitive upgrades are, are proving to be a big challenge. And, and C is tackling that in other areas. Um, but uh, relative to the IRA, there is this incentive to help support um, making those more affordable. Um, so on our next slide, uh, I, I wanted to note that um, for storage, there, uh, there are these uh, standalone credits. That's what you heard me just say about 48, uh, section 48 and the investment tax credit, as well as for section 25D for the smaller residential systems. Um, there are those limits, uh, the minimums above which these apply, and those are probably likely easy to achieve, um, especially for the, the larger commercial industrial and, and utility scale systems. Um, the 
you know, as you heard me say, the standalone credit for Section 48 isn't available until December 31. But if a project is uh, choosing to go with um, a solar plus storage system and the hybrid plant deployments, they could apply both ITC or PTC for those larger Section 48 uh, projects. Um, for uh, the smaller system, again, uh, that December 31 date is important uh, to consider for standalone. So, um, as mentioned, there are domestic manufacturing incentives in the IRA. So, I'm going to focus here on the domestic uh, content bonus credit. You know, taking note that guidance from Treasury will be required. For instance, if qualitative analysis what is typically uh, historically used uh, to determine domestic content. If, if quantitative analysis will still apply for determining if a product meets the minimum domestic percentage. You know, for storage, details on how and what minimum level will be needed, plus better definitions for end product, definitions for components, definitions for subcomponents will need clarified. For example, there are manufacturing incentives for inverters and also cells and modules for batteries, for example, plus also uh, incentives around um, some of the specific constrained materials, uh, you know, the, the cobalt and, and magnesium and other elements that, um, that have additional incentives for them. And the point is, is there'll need to be better clarity around how that accounting system happens for determining domestic content and how that relates to the end product, you know, the storage systems deployed in the field, components like those containerized systems, racking the inverters, the cells, the modules, as well as subcomponents, getting down to the individual cells, for example. All that will need to be clarified. Helpful also to keep in mind, this will also vary if storage is used for um, mobility, for electric vehicles, as compared to stationary applications. So there's actually a ton of clarity needed around domestic content um, and storage. So um, for a little bit more about Section 48, 48C, and 48X. Uh, really quick, there's an important need for these larger product projects to first need to pick one or the other. Um, you can't choose both in this case. Um, and so some of these, as they relate to the manufacturing, you're going to need to work with your vendors and interact with them relative to what this means for product sourcing and vendor selection. You know, for example, Largely for domestic content, a lot of that will be defined by the manufacturer themselves and what they're able to do. And so for many of the developers, for many of the owner operators, it, it means we'll need to strengthen your relationships with your vendors around uh, sourcing and selection. As domestic manufacturing picks up, new production capacity will help create more uh, jobs and also reduce shipping and, and import costs. And again, that will change the whole market around how, uh, how you select these vendors. You know, this will be great for the U.S. This will insulate the industry from the global dis supply disruptions and enhance the safety and reliability of electric grid by being able to source from domestic and trusted suppliers. You know, CIA has developed a roadmap for domestic solar manufacturing. And stay tuned because work has already begun on a domestic storage manufacturing roadmap that CIA is diving into later this fall. So a couple other things uh, before we pass back the baton to the uh, energy tool base team, you know, for the DOE's loan office, they've also received additional funding. And, you know, the single largest line item includes the $250 billion commitment to support a just transition to decommission uh, fossil fuels. You know, it's quite possible here that DOE will have to go through a rulemaking process as part of that implementation timeline. But within that, there are targeted provisions for transmission loans and also grants for states, tribes, and local communities to have uh, uh, to improve siting for high voltage lines. You know, with, for example, permitting clauses and other requirements for them to meet. You know, this is critical and important because for storage, if we cannot sort out how to build more transmission or build more uh, regional uh, transmission in in, in local uh, state level areas the value of storage is likely to increase because we'll need it to handle more congestion. And so these interactions around whether or not we can build transmission for, for solar are important, again, for uh, how, how value of storage will play out. The right-of-way restrictions 
for right-of-way restrictions, we recognize that there are compromises built into the bill. Um, for example, for solar right-of-way versus off onshore oil and gas. Um, again, this is actually just another area to watch for value of storage and how the resource build-out will happen. You know, if um, if uh, the Interior Department uh, uh, can't sort out these rules very quickly, and um, and there are uh, again to be fights between the fossil and the renewable sector, um, that will again enhance the value of storage. So, um, so with that, I want to say if you have any questions on the IRA, do please submit those to um, our clearinghouse email, ira at cia.org. Uh, relative to what I've been talking about today, there is a great public publicly available IRA fact sheet, and you can see the link there, and um, we can make sure sure and share that link with you all uh, later. For CM members, there are detailed summary, there's a detailed summary and an FAQ that is available for members on our website. And like I said, these slides here are really just a subset and really just highlights alone of a much uh, longer and more detailed webinar the IRA explained and that webinar archive as well as the slides uh, in whole are available to CM members. And so with that, I um, let me now hand it back to the Energy Toolbase team for some of their great market development insight and analysis on what some of the early IRA impacts may be. Great, thank you, Jeremiah. Hey, everyone, this is Adam with Energy Toolbase. Jeremiah, I may need you to stop your share to take over on mine. There we go, thank you. Bear with me one sec. Hmm. I'm having a hard time sharing my screen. Tracy, I don't know if you want to just throw up my slides. Oh, there we go. I just got the permissions. Thank you. Here we go. Awesome. Uh, again, Adam with Energy Toolbase, Jeremiah, thank you so much. Uh, I really encourage folks to check out those uh, kind of longer form SEA resources if you haven't already. I have uh, been referencing those a lot myself over the last few weeks as questions come in. And uh, again, we asked Jeremiah to take everything uh, really kind of with a focus on storage and, you know, boil it down to 15 minutes. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot more and uh, there is more detail there. So uh, I encourage you to check that out. And uh, yeah, just a really quick uh, note before I dive in. Uh, thank you to SIA so, so much for all the work they did on this bill. Uh, obviously getting it to the finish line uh, it's it's really incredible you know just two months ago um, less than two months ago we got that big huge surprise announcement uh, that a deal had been reached and uh, less than a month ago this got signed into law so uh, I guess my last kind of point before I really dive in as a disclaimer is that you know this is very new to all of us uh, including us at energy tool base and we are you know working to make sense of this and I'm excited to show a lot of the analysis that we've done uh, starting with um, kind of really deep diving on the standalone energy storage tax credit. So without further ado, let me jump in. Uh, I just want to kind of begin by doing a quick run through of some of the advantages, okay, of deploying uh, storage in a standalone application compared to standalone solar or let's say um, solar plus storage applications. Right, so certainly on the rate tariff side where I'm gonna spend a lot of my time, um, you know, lots of folks know there are rate tariffs out there, especially in a commercial setting uh, that are not necessarily always conducive for solar. Um, so, uh, you know, when two good examples are, you know, high demand charges and uh, successor tariffs where solar exports to the grid get devalued. Um, in solar plus storage applications, uh, one area that we've looked at really extensively, uh, and this is pretty specific to California, um, is where the vast majority of the time you're doing a solar plus storage project um, in a commercial application in California, your customer is better off rate switching to what we refer to as a solar friendly rate. Uh, and what happens there, kind of just to summarize it, is the customer's demand charges are lowered in exchange for higher energy charges. And uh, basically the total project economics are certainly in their interest to, to rate switch. You know, you get more savings, the economics are gonna be stronger. Uh, but one of the implications that happens behind the scenes is that um, the value 
that storage captures actually gets squeezed a bit. Um, so, you know, certainly as we run a lot of uh, different types of analyses looking at standalone storage applications, um, you know, you no longer have to rate switch off of, um, you know, advantageous storage rates. And we'll dig in on that more in a minute. And then just very briefly on the site constraint side, uh, I think a lot of developers know these already, um, you know, in a behind the meter setting, there's certainly um, sites out there that just uh, are, are limited by physical space. Um, and, you know, the, these can potentially be good candidates for storage only. Uh, also, Jeremiah mentioned it on the interconnection side, um, especially when you're looking to deploy uh, larger amounts of solar, and large amounts of solar relative to the customer's load, um, you certainly can run into some interconnection uh, requirements where um, you know you're being you 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 can't prevent you can't export solar to grid, um, which may you know trigger additional um, costs and or lengthen interconnection timelines and, and trigger studies and things of that nature. Uh, and then this last point, I've got a couple slides at the end, um, and it's really important uh, as part of the IRA. Uh, the uh, charge from solar requirement for solar for storage goes away, uh, and that really does uh, unlock some additional value. And I'm going to show you exactly kind of how we are uh, quantifying that shortly. Okay, so this is really the big question that we're trying to answer here, which is, okay, now that we have let's say a 30% tax credit for standalone storage projects, um, you know, how much um, what, what, how compelling can the economics be? And it really, we think, boils down to these three uh, metrics primarily. Uh, obviously, the rate tariff itself, um, and you know, largely for most of the runs that we've done, it, it is pretty specific to the demand charge. Um, both the dollar per kilo hour, dollar per kilowatt value of the demand charge, and also the types of demand charges, uh, which we're going to look at in a minute. And then to a lesser extent, the uh, the energy uh, time of use rate differentials. Uh, a big one that we're really going to unpack is on the load profile side, um, where you know the shape of the customer's load and the volatility of their demand certainly can have a big influence. And then lastly, uh, we did run this across different storage system sizes uh, relative to the customer's uh, max annual demand. Okay, so we are going to uh, jump in and look at all the analysis we ran in just a second. Uh, I'm going to start with a quick review of the assumptions we used. All of this analysis, of course, was run in the ETB developer platform, uh, our sales and modeling tool that I hope you're all familiar with. Um, for the proposal inputs in the left column, um, everything is pretty standard here. We're assuming a 3% uh, utility escalation rate. Uh, all of this analysis is getting run on a pre-tax basis, I'll point out. And then, of course, on the incentive side, you know, we're modeling that 30% standalone tax credit for storage. Um, we are not including any adders. Uh, as Jeremiah mentioned, there are, you know, even some kickers where you can get up above that 30% rate. Um, and then we are also running this with both um, federal and state makers depreciation. Okay, and for the California runs, we're assuming no SGIP. So it's just really the tax credit and depreciation. Okay, over on the right for pricing, um, we spent a bit of time here, and I really wanted to use what I hope um, folks look at as conservative assumptions for what the all-in turnkey installed pricing um, lands at. And you can see where um, those values are in dollar per kilowatt hour terms. Uh, and how they scale down as the uh, the size of the storage gets larger. Um, and all of these were run using a kind of simplistic bid pricing model that we have. And I was um, basically assuming profit margins between let's say 20 and 25%. Um, so I hope if you're a developer and you're looking at this and you're looking at what those installed um, costs are that we're, that we're using for our kind of case studies, um, you know, those seem fair and even you know, healthy for you to, to make money doing this. Okay, let's jump into the runs. Actually, I have one more slide. Uh, this is always really important. Um, you've probably seen me do this in the past when we do kind of matrix analysis across different types of uh, runs. And what we do here is we just wanna use 
uh, a cross section of different types of load profiles um, to get an understanding of you know how that influences uh, savings and economics. So you can see here I've got four building types, um, you know, and the load factor is uh, is right there on that left table. Uh, of course, the lower load factor um, kind of represents a spike year um, or a higher volatility customer. Uh, in this case, the church or the office building, and then vice versa for a high load factor. Um, you know, the formula being um, simply the average KW demand from all intervals divided by the max KW demand for for all intervals for the customer. So you're always going to be between zero and one, and uh, lower load factor are the high volatility folks, and and vice versa um, in the case of the data center for the setups we did. Okay, so let's start with one run, and then we're going to expand this out and look at kind of the uh, range of different runs we did across a lot of these different dimensions here. So we're going to start with an office building in the sdg &E territory on the ALTOU rate, which everybody in S San Diego is uh, very familiar with. Uh, and we're sizing this one. The storage is getting sized at 50% of the customer's max demand. Um, so what I mean there, this particular load profile we imported in. And uh, by the way, this is real um, usage data for an actual office building customer. Um, they maxed out at about 250 kW. Uh, and the size of the storage system here was a 125 kW two hour battery. So 250 kilowatt hour. Uh, you can see the cost, um, 1280 a kilowatt hour. So that's coming in at about uh, $320,000. Okay, so looking over on the right, I, I definitely want to kind of highlight the fact that the sdg &E ALTOU rate is like undoubtedly one of the um, highest demand charge rates in the country. Uh, and it, it's a really, frankly, exceptional rate uh, for standalone storage as we're going to look at here. Um, you can see on the demand charge column, we've got both a uh, $33 per kW non-coincident demand charge right so their highest interval in the entire billing cycle uh, is getting billed at 33 dollars and then in addition to that there is also an on peak demand charge in both the summer and the winter um you know 42 dollars summer 30 dollars winter uh, and that is based on their highest registered demand in that on peak 4 p 4 p.m to 9 p.m period so two types of demand charges here uh, which is actually typical for um commercial rate tariffs in California and, and other parts of the country as well. I was going to just very briefly, let's see if this works, just before I kind of review all of the analysis, show, um, hopefully, I'm not seeing my screen preview. You guys are seeing my ETB developer view instead of the PowerPoint deck. Um, tell me if you're not in the chat. Um, so just very briefly, uh, how all of this analysis was run, let's just go look at one individual simulation. I always like to kind of jump into a summer month. I think that gives a good view. And again, we just kind of ran through all the assumptions. Let's just kind of look at a week of data or so. Uh, and you can see the storage dispatch, the standalone storage dispatch on the ALTOU rate here. Um, pretty straightforward. We're doing a lot of dispatch here in that four to nine window. Um, and I did not mention earlier in the assumptions section, but this, all of the um, energy storage simulation parameters are identical to what we use via our integrations on the platform. So we think these are really indicative and representative of what we could achieve in the field uh, in a standalone storage application. Um, not super aggressive, not overly conservative, um, you know, indicative of a, uh, of what's possible and uh, how much savings we could capture. Okay, so this is just, uh, again, how the behind the scenes of how simulations are performed. Uh, for all the folks that are on the call today that are our power users, you know all of this very, very well. I just wanted to kind of give some context for those of you that uh, um, may not um, have seen uh, how we run storage simulations on the platform. Okay, without further ado, let's look at the results. Okay, so uh, the storage, the economics, the savings here are incredibly strong. Um, you can see uh, energy storage savings 
we always like to look at it in terms of dollars per kilowatt hours of storage capacity. Uh, came in at a whopping $234 here. Um, so on the economic side, after accounting for uh, that 30% ITC and also both types of depreciation, as I mentioned, uh, you can see we're, we're coming in really, really strong at a two and a half year payback, uh, an I, uh, uh, internal rate of return uh, north of 30%. And I mentioned there was a note on, this, on the uh, assumption slide. All of these analyses we ran uh, we're on a 15-year basis. So I think that's another way of us really being conservative here. Um, we're not even factoring in um, storage replacement cost. Um, we're simply just um, looking at this all on a 15-year basis. So I think anybody would agree, very, very compelling economics here um, based on all those assumptions, which, um, as I mentioned a couple times, I think are, are, are quite reasonable and uh, maybe even conservative on the, uh, on the pricing side. Okay, let's now expand this out. Now that you've seen one run, uh, the idea here is to do a cross-section of runs, right? So all of these are still on that ALTOU rate, uh, and now we've uh, ran this across four different types of load profiles um, and three different types of storage system sizes. Um, I forget if I mentioned it, but uh, you know, storage sized at 25% of load, 50% of load, and 100% of load. Um, which just gives us an idea of uh, what sort of savings uh, variance and you know we're seeing based on uh, how the storage is sized. Tracy mentioned this earlier. This deck is going to be made available. All of the tables uh, with the analyses are uh, are in there. So if you want to dig deeper in that, um, by all means. Okay, so here are those runs visually presented here. Um, we're showing both the internal rate of return there on the left axis in blue and the uh, payback period in orange. Okay, so basically you can see that, um, maybe I guess just looking at you know the first three or six bars on the, on the left there, uh, the church and the office, you know, these have incredibly strong uh, IRRs and low paybacks. Um, you know, IRRs ranging from maybe 20 to 35% uh, and paybacks all sub five years. So regardless of system size here, very, very compelling for all of those runs. On the far right, you can see the data center runs. Remember, that's that really flat load profile uh, where there's simply not a lot of volatility. Uh, and our economics drop off really considerably over there, um, right? So IRR is now maybe ranging between three to 10%, paybacks um, maybe between, let's call it seven and 11 years, right? So the takeaway there, and this is a really important one, is that the load profile creates a lot of variance, um, you know, and we're going to see other examples of that where it's really, really influential on uh, if the deal, the standalone storage deal with the 30% tax credit is viable enough, right? Also, you'll see a little bit of variance, uh, less so, but due to the energy storage system sizing. Again, we ran these at 25%, 50%, and 100% of customers' max demand. Uh, and you can certainly see for the 100% runs, um, you're getting a little bit of uh, drop off. Uh, compared to the smaller size. Overall, this chart, clearly the economics are, are very, very strong across all these different runs. Okay, let me keep moving. Uh, I'm gonna move through this one really quick. Uh, we ran the same analysis on, across a few different rates. Uh, this is the Southern California Edison GS3 TOU option D rate. Uh, this is a very common um, medium size commercial customer rate in the SCE territory. Uh, I believe it's for customers with demands from 200 kW to 500 kW. Um, the same general trend here, um, which is lots of variance caused by the load profile. Um, you can even see on the far right there, the data setter runs actually went upside down. So uh, the IRRs actually go negative uh, and the payback goes up to, um, you know, it doesn't even beat our 15 year term. So um, you can certainly just say pretty, pretty explicitly those those projects would not be viable. Um, and again, just gives us a good sense of the variance we're seeing as a result of different load profiles. Um, and overall, this is a good rate um, for standalone storage. It's it's not as great as the SDG&E rate we just looked at, um, but it, it again depends on uh, the load profile as well. One more one, I'm actually just gonna kind of breeze over this slide because I wanna keep moving. Uh, also ran this for some uh, scenarios in the PG&E territory. Uh, a lot of the same general takeaways. 
and all of the tables uh, are in the appendix of this deck and uh, you can certainly dig in more later. Okay, so this is a neat thing we did lastly, which is we said, okay, um, we certainly want to expand this analysis out beyond California. And frankly, we want to think about this anywhere in the country, um, you know, and can a standalone storage project with a 30% ITC be viable, you know, wherever. And the, what we did here was um, we just ran it across a few different levels of uh, um, dollar per KW demand charge. So we ran it at a $20 demand charge, a 30 and a 40. Uh, just to get a sense of, um, you know, where those economics land. So it's important to note here, all of these were simply run using just a singular, let's say, $30 per KW non-coincident demand charge. Okay, so this differs a bit from those California runs, because remember, uh, in all of those cases, they had both a non-coincident demand charge in addition to a pretty rich on peak or coincident demand charge as they call it. So um, this is certainly um, a bit different in the sense that we're just looking at this from a, a singular um, non-coincident demand charge. Okay, so here's those runs visually presented. Um, let's see here, the first three on the left of the chart are you know, running this at a $40 demand charge uh, across a few different types of load profiles. You can see the, the admin building, the office and the church. Um, you know, maybe you could, you know, the summary here is to say the admin building economics are not great. Um, you know, maybe a 5% IRR, uh, a 10-year 10, 10 payback period, um, whereas the church on a $40, $40 demand charge uh, are very strong, you know, a 20% IRR uh, and a four-year payback period. And I, this is just going back to that same point I keep making, which is uh, the load profile really does have a lot of influence here. Um, and uh, can affect and frankly um, make a standalone storage project viable or, or not viable um, based on uh, the volatility of that, that customer's load. All of these were run at the 50% uh, the size. I think I have a note there on the screen mentioning that. Um, let's see here. Again, really important to note if you're looking at this and saying, okay, well, wherever I am in the country and I know what my customer's demand charge is on certain rate tariffs and you're thinking, well, or, you know, is standalone storage going to be viable for them? Um, remember, the reason that these look um, kind of comparatively much worse, really, than the California runs we just looked at is because these are just using that one non-coincident demand charge. And the point I'd make there is that there are just um, so many different types of demand charge structures out there around the country. Um, uh, coincident or on-peak demand charges are very, very common. Um, you know, we see those all over the country. Uh, there are, you know, tariffs that have both that non-coincident charge and an on-peak charge. There are tariffs that just have an on-peak charge. So um, really to understand, you know, what the economics would be uh, for a customer wherever you're developing projects, um, we'd really just want to run that uh, through the platform to get a good uh, understanding on that. Again, I guess one last thing I'll mention before I um, kind of move off of this section is I would like to think this is all using um, somewhat conservative pricing data. And one other point I'd make, none of this assumes any ITC adders. Um, so, you know, the, the adders that Jeremiah hit on and a lot of folks are talking about, um, you know, energy community, low income, domestic content, uh, that could certainly um, juice up these projects further if you're able to uh, claim one of those. Okay, very briefly, let me just kind of hit my key, key takeaways from this section. Um, I think, you know, it's fair to say that there's just a whole range of, uh, um, you know, savings and economics for these standalone projects. They could be really, really great, um, like no brainer great, uh, all the way down to like bad, like not viable, um, you know, upside down IRRs. And in that sense, I would say it is very similar to, uh, you know, solar only, or even a, a lot of solar plus storage analysis that we look at. Um, demand charges are definitely the most critical factor. Both the dollar per kilowatt demand charge level, and then of course also the demand charge structure. Um, you know, in the case of California, where you have both a NC charge and an on-peak charge, really can make a can make a big difference. One other point I'll make here: it kind of gets in the weeds. On all of the runs we did, 
um, demand charges actually, demand savings, I should say, accounted for something like 90% of the total storage savings. So again, it was really all about demand charges. And this is quite different, especially in some markets when you're doing solar plus storage, where if you really unpack and look at where the, the storage savings come from, in some of those rate switching scenarios, the majority of savings actually comes from energy charges. Um, it's just kind of an in the weeds point, but it really is interesting. Um, you know, point being standalone storage project, it, it really is largely all about demand. I've, I've made this point several times, load profile matters a lot. Uh, it can certainly literally make or break a project. Uh, and then of course the ideal combo we're looking for, uh, for very strong projects is, is a high demand charge with a spiky load profile. Um, i.e. The, uh, the San Diego Church or San Diego ALTOU office building. And then uh, on the sizing side, this is actually pretty consistent with what we see when we model solar plus storage projects, um, but for the optimal storage system sizing, uh, you're generally best off kind of sizing at either 25 or 50% um, of customer's max demand, uh, and you start to get some uh, fall off once you go to 100%. Okay, let me keep moving on. I'm looking at the clock here. Uh, certainly the next question that this, um, you know, we're all going to be wondering where is, you know, what markets uh, and what utility ter territories then um, are going to be viable for standalone storage opportunities. Uh, and we're very still much in the process of studying this. Um, we, we're certainly working to do this through a lot of our own in-house utility rate data. Uh, and we hope to publish something in the future there. Um, I have this NREL chart up. Uh, this is a little bit dated, but I've always liked this graph. Um, this is, I'm, I'm linking to the study uh, that NREL put out a couple years ago um, that really looks at uh, behind the meter um, rates with high demand charges all over the country. And they've got this little heat map. Uh, and you can just see here, I think the takeaway for me is that there are little pockets within this map within certain states um, where you really are seeing kind of higher demand charges. Um, and of course it is very rate tariff specific. Um, and then there's this one other cool chart that was in their study um, that showed the number of customers that are taking service under, let's say a demand charge greater than $20 per KW. Uh, again, I hope we can rerun this using a lot of our own internal analysis. Um, and cause this is a few years dated. I actually think these numbers would be quite a bit higher now. Um, given that this is just uh, slightly old data. Okay, let me switch gears really quickly and talk about how um, for solar plus storage projects, um, we can really get a bit of boost in savings when we're pairing storage with solar and we're removing that must charge from PV requirement, right? So everybody's familiar with this, you know, prior to a month ago, um, when you're pairing storage with solar, to get your tax credit, you had to charge from solar uh, at least 75% of the time. And that's always how we've run our simulations on the ETB developer platform. So removing that requirement really gives storage more flexibility and uh, can certainly uh, increase potential val value capture, which I'm gonna look at, we're gonna look at on the next slide here. Um, so how much, it, it really depends of course on the rate tariff, um, certainly cases where uh, the nighttime energy rate is a lot lower than the midday energy rate that you, you know, had been charging on. Um, if there's a big differential there, there's a big opportunity for uh, boosted savings for from storage, right? And you could run these uh, A-B tests in ETB Developer. It's really neat. We have all of this functionality built, um, and we've actually been kind of uh, geeking out and just running a lot of these on different tariffs to kind of understand if there's opportunities out there. I want to quickly mention this third point. Um, it kind of gets a little bit in the weeds, uh, but I can tell you the uh, the engineers on our controls team are really excited about this one. Uh, and that's this idea of, you know, being able to charge the battery in the middle of the night, not having to wait for the solar to come on, um, really de-risks is the word uh, I think Quinn just likes to use. Um, the storage system. So what it means is like we can have certainty that every single day we're coming into that morning with a full tank, right? So we, you know, we don't have um, bad solar days where, you know, it's, it's hard to charge because we don't have a lot of solar capacity to charge from. 
And there are also certain load profiles where you're seeing early morning peaks, early morning spikes, and it's a huge advantage uh, to have a full tank coming in every day and having the certainty of that. It's a little bit trickier to quantify than that earlier point I made, and I'm probably getting too deep in the weeds here, um, but it, it is a really important one to highlight and uh, something we're, we're, we're already looking at. Last point here, Jeremiah actually mentioned this earlier as well. Um, so we've been getting lots of questions on, okay, I've got a solar plus storage system that's already operational. Can I change the dispatch profile? Can I remove that must charge from PV requirement? Uh, and the answer there is we think um, likely this is only applicable for storage projects placed in service after uh, the end of this year. Um, that's our latest understanding. The answer is probably um, no, you cannot do that uh, for, for existing projects. Really quickly, um, I'm actually already running late on time. Um, just a very extreme example um, to illustrate my point from the last slide. This is an electric vehicle rate uh, in San Diego. That's got a really, really wide differential, as you can see, between the super off-peak rate, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and the off-peak rate. Um, we're talking about, you know, around uh, 30 cents a kilowatt hour differential. Um, so here's a rate where, you know, previously you've you've been, if you had solar and storage on this tariff, you've been charging midday, you know, when solar is producing. Um, and if you're able to simply change to middle of the night charging, you're really, really getting a uh, a big differential. This is an extreme case just for illustration purposes, um, but you know we, we'd see somewhere even in the neighborhood of 80% uh, more savings from storage simply by changing that software requirement and, and no longer requiring it to charge from solar. Uh, again, very much an edge case um, for a lot of the runs, and we didn't get a chance to do this really extensively um, across a lot of different schedules, um, but maybe we were seeing boosted savings in the neighborhood of maybe 5 to 15 percent uh, with a lot of variance uh, again highly dependent on the uh, rate tariff uh, and again you can run all of these yourself in ETV developer today so uh, we encourage you to uh, get with your account manager and do that very briefly uh, I just I, I mentioned we would hit on this so I'll just knock this one out in 90 seconds um, to kind of switch gears this is my last slide um, lots of questions coming in about the production tax credit, uh, and am I better off taking that instead of the uh, ITC for solar projects? And for the analysis that we've ran, uh, the answer is almost always no. Uh, it's not even close. Um, for the PTC, you can see really quickly at a high level there, kind of starts at that $26 a megawatt hour rate, right? Uh, and it runs for 10 years, uh, and it, it rises based on inflation. So we built a spreadsheet to compare these. Um, uh, again, like what level would you need to be at on an installed cost um, for the PTC to um, equal uh, what you're getting on that 30% ITC? And, um, you know, here's just kind of a, an example, like for 1600 kilowatt hours for every kilowatt of PV capacity, um, you know, you'd need to be um, on the blue line, you know, at a dollar fifty four at a dollar fifty four um per DC watt installed uh just to break even. Uh and that actually doesn't even account for the time value of money component. Because again, the PTC is paid out over 10 years, the ITC gets paid out up front. So the orange line is basically saying on a on a NPV basis or a time value basis, you'd actually need to be at a dollar roughly um just to kind of break even. Uh, the PTC is as good as the ITC, and uh, we don't even think it's close. Uh, I think for behind the meter projects, you, you're likely not gonna see much of this, and it's just really um, only applicable for front of the meter projects. Okay, I ran way long. This concludes my section. Chris Seffel, who manages our enterprise sales team, has a few really important slides. So Chris, I'm gonna pass it to you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I'm going to go through this relatively quick so that we have some time at the end here for questions still. Um, we did want to take uh, the last couple minutes before we move to questions uh, to discuss some actionable short-term and long-term steps um, that you can take to fully capitalize on the historic legislation um, and kind of summarize some of the previous information that we presented. Um, hope is with this last section that you're able to leave this webinar 
um, not only with a better understanding of the legislature, uh, but also with some ideas so you can start developing a strategic um, approach and, and focus on execution for your business. Uh, so first item here, uh, maybe the most obvious one is to simply look back at your past projects where the economics were already pretty close. Uh, for PV only projects uh, modeling for 2022, that would uh, mean a 4% increase. And for projects that were planned for 2023, it would mean an immediate 8% boost. Uh, for PV and ESS, you will also get the same boost uh, with the added benefit of not having the charge restrictions. So Adam just went over uh, some of the value that we might find there. Um, and not being restricted by the solar only charging uh, will improve many of the projects uh, that you look at economics while also reducing that operational risk. Um, looking at past projects may also mean you already have a relationship with the customer uh, and they may already uh, be comfortable with renewable projects, which can help shorten that sales cycle. Uh, the second point here, um, seek out standalone storage opportunities. Um, Adam did a good job of kind of explaining some of the scenarios around that. Um, as well as his earlier analysis, painting a clear picture that for behind the meter standalone projects, um, there can be a compelling um, uh, story to be told uh, in areas with high demand and uh, loads that tend to be spiky. Um, standalone might also make sense for areas where it's challenging to install solar or put enough solar on site to meet the previous charging requirements um, that may have negated um, putting storage on those sites. Uh, we've also seen a significant improvement on project economics for front of the meter projects uh, that previously were unable to take advantage of any tax credits, um, while also de-risking projects and markets with proportionately higher merchant revenue sources. Um, next on the list here uh, is retrofit opportunities. So similar to the first point, uh, in a lot of cases, you may already have a relationship with the customer and know that the customer is receptive to renewables. Uh, for older projects, the addition of storage may also unlock additional value streams such as demand response programs or enable rate switch to more favorable rate. Um, retrofits will also typically have really readily available data sets and load profiles through existing on-site monitoring, uh, making it easier to work through your ETB developer analysis. Uh, the last two items on this slide uh, are directly related to the specific components of the bill. Um, first, leveraging organizations like SIA to identify opportunities in low income and energy communities and or sourcing uh, domestic content. Uh, as discussed earlier, being able to take advantage of those adders will significantly increase the value of the tax credit being claimed. Uh, and second here, for organizations that are already working in the nonprofit space or looking to work in the nonprofit space, the option for direct pay will give more flexibility to businesses looking to build out the renewable projects. Um, that flexibility should enable more organizations that previously would not have had access to that type of invest uh, incentive to kind of move forward and, and take advantage of those. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so there are several ways that ETBs enabling our developer partners and users to quickly capitalize on the new tax credits, uh, reg regardless of what your preferred strategy is. Uh, first, you'll, be, you'll find that all of the updated incentives have been loaded into ETB developer and can be accessed by users uh, during the proposal creation process. That should allow you to easily add and update incentives uh, to both new projects as well as update previously modeled projects. Uh, for any projects that you have modeled in the past or any new projects, you can also toggle the charge requirements from charge from PV and no charge requirement to do some A-B testing to determine where charging from the grid now makes sense. Uh, also, as previously discussed, removing the charge restriction may help projects that previously did not meet economic hurdles meet those financial requirements as well as uh, reduce the risk profile on some of those projects. Uh, we've also been developing a tool to help model retrofit projects uh, that upon deployment will be accessible directly through ETB developer. Uh, the tool will, will help disaggregate solar and building load profiles on sites that don't have that readily available uh, separated data. Um, so again, really closing the gap on um, what, what is available and, and what's not really easily available. Uh, and lastly, uh, connecting with resources to help identify those low income and energy communities within uh, the geographies that you operate. So I would encourage anyone with questions about any of the above items to reach out to your account manager. Um, for anyone who's not already an ETB developer user, um, we would invite you to sign up for a free trial 
uh, where you'll have the opportunity to explore all of the above described features as well as all of the other features on the platform um, when you sign up for free trial nothing is is kind of held back or locked away and so the last thing i'm going to talk about here and we can jump into the questions is um, energy tool tool bases three core products uh, i think most people are familiar with their sales and modeling software e2b developer um, we've been in the market with that product for over eight years now and prou proudly work with over 1500 organizations uh, to help model solar and storage projects uh, with our tier one energy storage integrations and newly added financial integrations. Uh, on the post install side, we do have Acumen EMS, which is an advanced energy management system, uh, fully integrated with a number of leading ESS vendors, uh, such as BYD, Socomec, Delta, and Tesla. Um, we have over 100 systems deployed or scheduled for deployment using that platform uh, across three different countries and 10 states. Uh, so we're capable of operating in a variety of different behind the meter and front of the meter applications. And last but not least, ETB Monitor. That's our cloud-based monitoring platform with the ability to track not just the operational performance, but also the financial performance of the project. Uh, this innovative feature means more visibility and transparency into the total performance of your project uh, with less work on the back end for your team. Uh, again, if you have any other questions on these products or any of these products are, are new to you, we'd love the opportunity to discuss further and encourage you to reach out to your account manager uh, or schedule some time using the link on our website. Um, I know that was really quick. So again, feel free to reach out uh, for a little more detail on all of that. And I will now pass it back to Tracy uh, for some Q&A. Thank you, Chris. And we have a lot of questions coming in. I know we're coming up to the top of the hour, so we likely won't get to those. I know Jeremiah has been answering some questions in the chat, so we appreciate that, Jeremiah. Um, the recording is going to be sent out with the slide deck. Lots of questions on that after the webinar, so be on the lookout for that email. And Chris, you had mentioned um, standalone ESS projects. Um, so kind of following up on your segment, has ETB deployed any standalone ESS projects to date? Yes, we do have some standalone storage projects. Uh, we also have projects where we have what would typically be, typically be considered undersized solar, where we, were, we have been charging from grid and solar. Um, so both of those scenarios uh, we have experience with. Great, thanks. Uh, we, this is one for you, Jeremiah, and you may have answered it in the chat, but we did have some, a lot of questions, people asking if you could elaborate what would qualify as low, in, low income economic project for the IPC credits. Yeah, great. Um, it's, it's a great question. There, there's very specific um, guidelines for that. Uh, let, me, let me find them in the chat because I was just pasting them. Um, and it's defined as a census tract with a poverty rate of at least 20%, as well as a census tract where the medium family income is 80% or less of the statewide medium family income. Uh, you know, in practice, there's a ton of details around eligibility for this, including like you know, limits on the plant size, how to apply for this credit and whatnot. So I do want to recommend folks look for more details in those summary, uh, in those detailed summary guidelines. Thanks, Jeremiah. And Adam, Jeremiah, you can jump in if you see any you want to ask here. But um, Adam, I'll give this one to you. What are some implications of the IRA and the NEM3 proceeding in California as that's currently going on right now? Yeah, I forgot to hit on that. I um, did not manage my time well because I took too much time and I actually didn't hit on a couple topics. And I know we mentioned that, Tracy, on the webinar registration page. Um, the answer is we don't know. Um, we're probably going to speculate, uh, you know, everybody's speculating on how NIM3 in California is going to come down. Uh, my personal opinion is it probably has some effect. You know, the, the folks at the PUC and, you know, other public utility commissions around the country are certainly looking at uh, what just happened uh, with this historic legislation. And um, I would be surprised if they're not um, thinking that, wow, this uh, this big boost maybe uh, gives them cover to... Um, to, I don't know, weaken or kind of come down maybe a little closer to the utility side of the argument. That's just my speculation. We don't know. I think nobody knows, uh, uh, but we're all anxiously waiting for that new revised um, proposed decision and the NEM3 proceeding to drop. 
Great. Thank you, Jeremiah. I'll give this one to you. What are the place and service dates? Could you talk about those again and how does that affect standalone storage ITC eligibility? Yeah, so for residential systems, the standalone uh, battery credit applies to expenditures made after December 31st. You know, basically, if you're doing a solar plus storage, you can get that 30% ITC for the small residential systems. But if you're doing standalone only for residential, you've got to wait until that December 31st date. You know, for the larger systems, Section 48, as I noted in the slide, you, you can get going with IT, ITC and PTC now. But systems placed in service before Treasury guidance can use that full amount. But after Treasury provides guidance on those um, prevailing wages, on the apprenticeship program, et cetera, after that guidance is, is published, then it will drop to the base incentive, I think that's 6%. And then getting back up to 30% requires uh, meeting that guidance. And so a 2024 date has been thrown out by for Treasury at least putting out guidance uh, before then, and we believe they will do it faster than that, but that's where that 2024 date also comes into the mix. Thanks, Jeremiah. Let me, as I'm going through these questions, trying to, trying to see them all, um, there's a lot of questions about direct pay and maybe I could send this one to Adam or Jeremiah, but is direct pay applicable to storage? Can adders increase the direct pay? I'll take a crack, and Jeremiah, you can follow up. Um, this is actually something we probably, I would have loved for uh, myself and Chris to, to have hit on a bit more. Direct pay absolutely applies to storage projects. Uh, direct pay is incredibly exciting. Uh, it's a huge opportunity for tax-exempt entities um, to um, get um, full haul and in the form of a, a cash payment from Treasury. So, you know, on Chris's slide on, hey, if you're a developer, uh, who should you be targeting and what should you be doing next? Um, we, we think tax-exempt entities are going to be very much in play um, and it's going to be very compelling to get a, uh, a full 30% direct payment. Granted, you don't get to capture the um, depreciation benefits, which uh, all of my models used, um, but direct pay is a big, big deal. I think we'll be talking about it a lot into the future, and uh, it's 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 ripe for developers to kind of target um, certain types of customers. Back to my earlier example, the church, which was incredibly compelling. Well, actually, th that customer would would qualify for a direct payment uh, in lieu of the uh, the ITC because of their uh, tax exempt status. Yeah, and I'll just add on there that you know it's really um, eligible for those specific entities, the tax exempt entities like churches, schools, and, you know, other nonprofits, any state government, uh, you know, there's Tennessee Valley Authority, so federal energy entities, uh, tribal government, and also uh, Alaska Native corporations as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of details for that and, and even specific to technologies. You know, so for hydrogen versus um, other renewables, for example, you want to look into the details. Great, thanks. Uh, Chris, this one I think would be best for you. Does Energy Toolbase expect this to have an impact on ESS supply? And if we do expect it to, has anything been done to mitigate shortages? Uh, really good question. Um, coming out of, of COVID, we've already seen some supply constraint and I'm sure everybody's been feeling that uh, in addition to some of the increases in cost. Uh, we do expect to see uh, a significant increase, um, both because the attachment rate, we expect it to go up, uh, as well as the opportunity for standalone storage. Um, we have taken the, the, the steps to secure some um, pipeline. And so we do have available storage, uh, depending on the product, uh, between the seven and nine month range um, with some, some guaranteed arrivals for April. Uh, we will also continue working with our partners to um, make sure that we do have contracted supply. Thanks, Chris. And um, I'll just ask you this one, too, because I've been seeing a lot of questions about retrofits in the chat. Can Energy Toolbase model retrofits in ETB, or can users model retrofits, I guess, in ETB developer? Yes. So um, I mentioned on one of my slides that we are um, looking to deploy an update to ETB developer that will allow 
users to disaggregate solar from building load profiles. Um, in the case that you do have separate load profiles already, um, that can easily be done uh, in E2B Developer today, and your, your account manager will be able to walk you through that. Thanks. I know we are about six, seven minutes now after the hour, and a lot of the questions coming in, they are very project specific. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we're going to be reaching out to you in a personalized email after the webinar throughout this week, answering those questions for you. So if we didn't get to them, we apologize, but we will um, throughout the week. So any any other ones you wanted to address, Adam or Jeremiah or Chris, otherwise we can probably wrap up Q&A here. I think I'm good. There's so many good ones, Tracy. And yeah. uh, yes, we will make a point to um, really respond back on email on all of these. Thank you guys for all the engagement. Um, and sorry, I ran so long and cut Q&A short. It is all good. Um, yeah, so we're going to stop here. And thank you again to Jeremiah for being on today's webinar, along with Adam and Chris. And our team, like we've mentioned throughout this webinar, we're prepared to help you guide help guide you through your projects amid the changes this bill is bringing so please be on the lookout for that email that'll have the recording the slide deck along with a lot of other helpful links from this webinar if you have any other questions or need assistance you can contact your account manager or set up a meeting with our team which that link will be in the follow-up as well so with that being said thank you everyone for joining and have a great rest of your day